Hi, and welcome to Tom Kennedy Science, and I'm your host, Dr. Tom Kennedy. So today, I'm continuing on my series of lectures on how eukaryotic cells regulate gene expression. Now remember, this is very important. The reason why is, and gene expression is our cells and all eukaryotes, and prokaryotes for that matter too, they have way more genes, and they can make many more proteins than they need at any given time. So they need to be able to respond to the environment so they can regulate their genes to respond to the environment. And in our cells, well, we have like over 200 different tissue types. We have muscle cells, skin cells, liver cells. Those cells produce different types of proteins. So what's going on inside of a muscle cell is very different than a liver or a neuron. So they need to be able to regulate when you turn off and when you turn on those genes. Now, I'm talking about those on and off switches again. It doesn't always work like that. Sometimes it's like a volume knob. You can ramp down gene expression or turn it all the way up. And then remember this also, gene expression. Our DNA holds all the information to make a protein. And then we transcribe that information into a messenger RNA. And then we take the messenger RNA and we translate that into a protein. So gene expression is the flow of information from genes to proteins. And when we talk about gene expression, just making proteins from our, from our genes. And then when we regulate it, when do we make those proteins and how long do they last? So let's talk about something called epistasis. What exactly is epistasis? Well, this is when one gene controls another gene, and it's actually quite common. So we can use labs as an example to understand epistasis, at least basically, because things are always a little bit more complicated than the way we present them in, a, in, in an intro class, but this works. So we've got these labs. We've got black labs, chocolate labs, and yellow labs. Now the fur color is produced by melanin. And of course, you can see that there are two different types of melanin. You've got black melanin and you've got brown melanin. And then you also have no melanin, which is a yellow lab. So how does this work? So let's begin here. Black is a dominant allele. And then the brown or the chocolate color, that is a recessive allele. So here's our dogs. If you have a lab that has at least one of the dominant black alleles, you potentially have a black lab. Chocolate labs, that chocolate is recessive, so if you've got an allele with two of the recessives, you could potentially have a chocolate lab. And did you notice? I said potentially, because this is where epistasis comes into play, that you can have a BB and still have a yellow lab. How does that work? Welcome to epistasis. The gene for fur color is under control by another regulatory gene that we will call E. And of course, there's a dominant and a recessive form of it. So if you have the dominant form, the gene works and you actually have melanin production. If you have two copies of the recessive allele, then the gene doesn't work and you have no melanin. So let's take a look here. Here's our three labs again. If you've got either homozygous big B, big B for black melanin, or your heterozygous big B, little b, you are potentially black lab as long as you have at least one functioning copy of your regulatory gene, which is dominant. However, even if you're homozygous or heterozygous for black fur, if you have two copies of, of your regulatory gene that are recessive, you're a yellow lab. If you're a chocolate lab, you have two of the recessive brown alleles, you're homozygous, and you will be a chocolate lab as long as you receive at least one copy of the regulatory gene. So you could be homozygous big E, big E, or heterozygous big E, little e. But even if you have the alleles for a chocolate lab, if you are homozygous for the recessive form of the regulatory gene, you are a yellow lab. So yellow labs are all recessive on their regulatory genes. There you go. And that's how you can get three different lab codes by whether or not you have melanin production based on your genes for the regulatory gene. And like I said, it doesn't matter what your genes are for producing melanin. If you're not putting down melanin, you are a yellow lab. Now, there's also regulatory genes that work in humans. And some of those regulatory genes kick on and off as we go throughout our life. So one of them is 
um, lactose intolerance. And this is a map showing lactose intolerance worldwide. And if you notice, the northern parts of the world, like in Europe and in uh, North America, guess what? Most people can drink milk. But in a lot of places around the world, you can't drink milk. So milk is produced by all mammals. And in fact, mammals, memory glands, right? The modified sweat glands is what produces our milk. And all mammals produce milk for their babies. It's a common characteristic of all mammals. And in fact, uh, we've inherited that for like hundreds of, probably 150 million years, all mammals have produced milk for their babies, including things like sea otters. I like sea otters. Did you know that these sea otters are like up to five feet long? And uh, that one's eating a sea urchin. They crack it open on their tummies. But if you notice, adult mammals don't drink milk. Like seriously, don't give milk to your cat. They're lactose intolerant as an adult. They can't drink it. And we all have the genes to produce the enzyme lactase. But as we become an adolescence, it gets turned off. And it gets turned off by the MCM6 gene. That's why mammals don't drink milk as an adult. I, I can't help myself. I love South Park. And there's this great episode called Go God Go 1 and 2. Not family friendly. Don't watch this in front of your parents. This is um, a, a show for adults. It's not for kids. At any rate, I just love this episode. because They totally incorporated elements of Buck Rogers. And they had Eric Cartman freeze himself for 500 years. And when he wakes up, the sea otters are sentient. And they have formed the Atheist Allied Alliance, who is at war with the United Atheist Alliance. It's hilarious. It's some of the best TV ever. Let's get back to the lactose intolerance, right? Okay, so in the Bronze Age, there were mutations in populations of humans, especially ones around cows, that basically um, mutated that regulatory gene that turns off lactase as adolescence. Since it mutated, the regulatory gene no longer worked. So what does that mean? It means that you could drink milk as an adult. And the reason why is because of that mutation in MCM6 gene, your lactase gene stays on throughout your life. So for those of you that can drink milk, you are a mutant. We're all mutants. We all have mutations, but that is caused by mutation. And of course, for those of us that are lactose intolerant, I'm not as bad as others. You can't break down the sugar lactose, which is a dimer, right? It's made up of glucose and galactose. So because we can't break it down in our small intestine, it goes into our large intestine. And guess what? You have bacteria in there that can break it down, but there's no oxygen. So they ferment it. And this creates gases like carbon dioxide, methane. And uh, it also causes some other problems and lead to diarrhea. And you're producing methane. Don't try to light them on fire. Your flatulence, it would be flammable. I know. South Park and flammable farts. Where have I gone to these days? But that's what happens. So I hope you enjoyed this on epistasis, on how one gene controls another gene. It is actually quite common in humans. And another example of epistasis would be like eye color. And that would be another good example of epistasis. So stay tuned because the next episode we're going to talk about epigenetics.